quick introduction of our distinguished speaker of today, uh, Mrs. Emily O'Reilly. She is the European Ombudsman. She was elected in that office first in July 2013. She was re-elected already in December 2014 for a five-year mandate. And she's actually a very interesting uh, personality in the sense that she has had a distinguished career as an author, as a journalist, as a broadcaster. She had become Ireland's first female ombudsman and information commissioner. Uh, she was also appointed in 2007 as commissioner for environmental uh, information. As former political editor, broadcaster and author, she has had significant domestic and international recognition. She has been at Harvard. Uh, she has had multiple national awards, including um, honorary doctorates from uh, various uh, universities. She has graduated, in fact, from one of our partner universities in the FRAME project, namely UCD, uh, who is one of our core partners in the FRAME project, but she has also a graduate diploma from Trinity uh, College. Um, there has been a lot of other things that I could continue to dwell upon, but I, I will not do so. I, let me just say again how delighted we are that you are with us today and that you will speak about fundamental rights in the EU, the achievements, the challenges, especially in light of your new strategy. You have the floor. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for that uh, very uh, warm and generous introduction. It's beautiful to be here in, in this lovely building. I'm very jealous, I have to say. Um, uh, but thank you very much for the invitation to address you here today. Some of you may not be very familiar with my office, so let me start off by briefly describing what the European Ombudsman does, which is essentially to deal with complaints against the EU administration. That includes all the institutions, bodies and agencies of the EU, from the Commission to the smallest executive agency, and including, for example, the European Central Bank and the Court of Justice in its administrative functions. Any citizen, resident, business or organisation within the EU that believes that they have essentially been treated unfairly by an EU body can make a complaint to my office. It's not necessary either to be directly affected by the alleged maladministration. So many complaints come to us from civil society groups and from NGOs. The complaints span a very wide spectrum from the failure to reply to a communication, to give access to documents, alleged conflicts of interest, contract disputes, alleged failures in relation to state aid investigation procedures, perceived unfairness in a recruitment process, essentially any complaint that alleges that an EU body has not complied with a law or a principle of good administration that is binding on it. So, an environmental NGO might complain that an expert group advising on health legislation is unbalanced, another that a funding programme lacks human rights compliance obligations, a small business in Finland might complain about not having been paid on time for a service provided to the Commission. A young graduate might complain that a recruitment competition he failed to pass wasn't fair. A journalist might complain that the Council denied him or her certain documents. An Italian citizen might complain that the Commission had failed to deal with an infringement case properly. A multinational company might complain that the Commission had not followed fair procedure in an antitrust case. Some complaints do allege actual illegality, but the majority concern maladministration, complaints about perfectly legal acts, but which nonetheless violate a principle of good administration, such as equity, proportionality, timeliness, objectivity, transparency, and so on. The right to good administration is a citizen's right, enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. My recommendations are not binding, but the vast majority are accepted. Approximately 90% are accepted. I have strong powers in terms of inspection of documents and can ask any EU official to account for actions in relation to a complaint. I can also investigate an issue on my own initiative without necessarily having received a formal complaint. But before I go into more detail about my strategy, which is essentially to make the European Ombudsman a more effective and useful office 
through a more direct focus on issues in the public interest. I want to spend a few moments talking about the current state of human rights within the EU, an issue which I have no doubt devours a great deal of your attention. The multiple crises currently facing the EU, and particularly the migration crisis, have created laboratory conditions for human rights practitioners where on a daily, even hourly basis, one can see the padada as danced between rights and pressure politics being played out. When the EU Special Envoy for Human Rights, Stavros Lambrinidis, came here to speak with you in 2013, he asserted correctly that it is wrong to assume that human rights sits at just one side of a problem. Every global conflict, he said, has its origin in some kind of human rights violation. Equally, he said, every conflict resolution has a human rights dimension. However, it takes time, nonetheless, for that thesis fully to assert itself. So last week, as the Polish Prime Minister was summoned before the European Parliament to account for her new government's position on the rule of law in the wake of a newly opened Commission investigation under its new framework on the rule of law, into changes to the Constitutional Court and media control, the German Chancellor was meeting with the Turkish Prime Minister in order, essentially, to do a deal on money and migrants. And in the same week, as the world's richest people met in very snowy splendour in beautiful Dallas to shape our world and catastrophize about the migration crisis, another 45 of those migrants died in the Aegean Sea, 17 of them children. So what Europe is getting now is a bucket of very cold water on human rights complacency. No one can deny that the EU has put human rights, the rule of law and democracy to the forefront of the European project and has been met in many cases with stunning success. Even leaders with tendencies to authoritarian rule do at least have to pay lip service to their commitment to human rights, no matter how skewed their concept of those rights are. The EU attempts to embed human rights principles in its foreign policy, in its humanitarian policies, in its cohesion policies, and in its trade policies. Even if the benchmark can at times seem rather pliable, it nonetheless remains. But the current pushback from the rise of populism, growing anti-EU sentiment, terror that has moved from far away right into our own cities, the drowning of migrant children that we can see in real time on our smartphones, is challenging our human rights foundations, our commitment to human rights as never before. Pushed by events, the daily political choices being made by Angela Merkel, by Franz Timmermans, by David Cameron, by Francois Hollande, by Donald Tusk, and by others, are the real stuff of what it means to live and act now in an EU with more laminated human rights treaties, charters, and covenants on the walls of its public spaces than arguably anywhere else on earth. The Paris attacks in November made us consider not just the fragility of a human rights culture, but the way in which single but intensely vivid incidents can provoke popular emotional responses that politics is forced to react to. The drowning of the Syrian child Alien, the events of New Year's Eve in the German city of Cologne, and the, just this week, the murder of a young aid worker in a Swedish migrant center, propelled a popular response from one extreme of emotion to another. The one, pity and solidarity, the second, fear and the desire to expel. So politicians are forced to act and react to often diametrically opposed popular reactions, with scarcely time to absorb, to reflect and to think through the unintended consequences. The current crisis also forces to examine our tendency to look on historic atrocities, such as the Holocaust, and marvel at how such events were allowed to happen, as if the people who caused them to happen, or who stood dumbly by as they happened, were of an order manifestly different from us, their enlightened, human rights-loving, 21st century descendants. The mass murders in the Nazi camps were not entirely unknown about, even as they were taking place. The Polish resistance fighter Jan Karski made a doomed attempt to alert UK and US governments to the horrors in Poland, while the SS St. Louis 
with almost 1,000 Jewish refugees aboard, sailed from Hamburg in 1939 and was turned away at Cuban, US and Canadian ports, eventually forced to return to Europe, where, while several countries did indeed accept them as refugees, an estimated 220 later perished in the Holocaust. So as we wonder at the actions and inactions of our grandparents, so too will our children and grandchildren ask why thousands of migrants, fleeing persecution in most cases, drowned in full view in European waters. Why there was such a reluctance to accept them. Why a generous-hearted response in some countries was used as negative political capital in others. Because if we look into the interstices, the small spaces of the Karski affair, of the St. Louis affair, we will see, just as we see today, all the messy political plays, the contemporary economic, social and cultural forces that diluted the starkness of the plight of the terrified and the dispossessed. The hindsight is streamed in black and white, but real-time vision is a monochrome grey. Imagine the scepticism on a grandchild's face 20 years from now as we attempt to explain Brexit or Trump or this member state election or that member state election or how the Dublin regulation was a mess or how this geopolitical sensitivity had to be managed or that relationship encouraged or a blind eye turned to a clear human rights breach for the sake of a perceived greater good. <clears throat> the historians alone, I submit, may be the only ones fully to understand, because the Holocaust too had its Brexits and its geopolitical moral compromises and its enemy of my enemy friends. The rest will see nothing but the tiny body of Alien and gaze at those by then faded cartoons depicting him with angel wings or being wept over by the sea creatures. So where are we now exactly in Europe when it comes to the migrant issue, as if anyone really has a clue? How far off are we from what we believe in? How detached has practice become from theory? Amnesty International's document for primary school children very simply explains, human rights are all the things human beings are entitled to and need in order to live healthy, dignified, and safe lives. It goes on then to refer to the right to life and to live in freedom and safety, the right not to be treated cruelly, the right to be treated fairly by the law, the right to have ideas and to say what we think, the right to meet other people and to assemble in a peaceful way, the right to live a life of dignity, which includes having a home, enough money to live on, and health care if we get ill, the right to education and to receive free primary education. We're simply talking about a civilised way of living with justice and equality for all. These rights, as you all know, have been recognised in a succession of legal instruments at international, regional and national level. Here in Europe, we have the Council of Europe's European Convention on Human Rights, which each of the 28 EU member states has signed up to. The EU, in its own right, is required under the Lisbon Treaty to accede to this convention, but has not yet done so. The EU also has its own Charter of Fundamental Rights from 2000, and which became legally binding in 2009. And then reality bites. So how do we practice then when it comes to, say, the situation at Calais, where several thousand people are living in miserable conditions and young men are daily risking and losing their lives to get across to England? Last Saturday, the UK Labour Party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, visited the Calais camps and called on the UK government to allow those living there to come into the UK on humanitarian grounds. And because, he stated, that number could easily be absorbed and cared for. Yet just days earlier, speaking in the context of welcomes by other politicians, the French Prime Minister noted that such generous gestures are quickly picked up on smartphones in Syria, and even more people start to move. A former Irish Prime Minister, Gareth Fitzgerald, once remarked that politics is the most ethically challenging profession of all. And when we see on a daily basis now in Europe the way in which the daily crises thrown up by the migrant issue are being handled, we can certainly see the truth of that. Hardly a day goes by when the great EU values of human rights, democracy and the rule of law are not stirringly invoked 
Yet the messy compromise is currently being attempted, attempted in order to appease the diverse and often competing demands of the member states exposes the greyness of our actual human rights landscape. Take last November's agreement between Turkey and the EU, under which Turkey is to take steps to help ease the flow of asylum seekers into Europe. In return, the EU is committing to contributing €3 billion Euro to Turkey towards the cost of looking after the more than 2 million refugees in that country. In addition, there is a commitment to help revitalise Turkey's EU accession process. The hope, of course, is that this and other measures will help to stop the flow of migrants coming into the EU. In its relations with the wider world, the Treaty on European Union requires the EU to promote its values, including human rights. It is required to contribute to peace, security, <coughs> sustainable development of the earth, eradication of poverty and the protection of human rights. The European Parliament in particular has been promoting a practice whereby the EU, in order to meet its objective of placing human rights and democratic values at the heart of its relations with the wider world, would insist on human rights clauses being a feature of all its international agreements. Yet it appears that in the recent agreement, the EU did not insist, to any great extent, on any human rights commitment from Turkey. While the EU may insist this agreement does not dilute, of course, its commitment to ensuring respect for human rights in Turkey. Many in Turkey see things differently. The Turkish author, Elif Shafak, is a case in point. In 2006, Ms. Shafak was prosecuted in Turkey because of what a character in one of her novels, a work of fiction, said about the Armenian genocide. Beginning just about 100 years ago, upwards of 1.5 million Armenians were either murdered or expelled from their homes within the Ottoman Empire. While many countries around the world, including at least 15 EU member states, have formally recognised that this was genocide, <coughs> the Turkish state refuses to accept that this was the case. In any event, Alif Shafak was ultimately acquitted, but not surprisingly, she found the experience very unnerving. Today, she is particularly concerned about threats to freedom of the press in Turkey. In a recent interview, Ms. Shafak was very critical of the fact that, as she sees it, the EU, in its November agreement with Turkey, abandoned its human rights obligations and forgot about freedom of speech and about democracy, despite having been asked explicitly by two imprisoned Turkish journalists not to do so. Ms. Shafak commented, Sometimes I feel I have more faith in European ideals than some of my British or French friends. For them, it's a financial burden. For me, Europe is primarily about values, about fundamental rights, freedom, women's rights. The message from the November agreement, however, was, she said, Europe has put its values on hold. Now, I have no doubt that Chancellor Merkel would have sympathy with Ms. Schaffer's views. Equally, in the same week as a French counterpart spoke in apocalyptic terms about the possible destruction, not of Schengen, but of the EU itself, if the migrant uh, crisis is tackled, she might ask for some understanding of her own ethical dilemma, which, of course, is not just hers, but ours. This was, after all, a woman who did attempt to adhere to the highest of the European ideas, to acknowledge the universality of human rights, when she said last year that there was no proper limit to the number of Syrian refugees her country might take. And then politics happened. <coughs> so where does the European Ombudsman fit into all of this? To explain my strategy, we need first to look away from the very clear-cut, stark and obvious human rights issues around migration. It's easy to see and understand poverty, war, terror and death. But what is less easy to see are the sometimes obscure, frequently labyrinthine ways in which hundreds of political decisions and administrative actions, unconnected from war or peace, nonetheless contribute to breaches of human rights. I recently read a scientific paper in which the author linked the Syrian conflict to climate change. Agricultural policies, he theorised, pursued by Syrian governments, placed an over-reliance on access to copious amounts of water. When the water tables, because of climate change, began to go lower, rural communities were gravely affected and began to migrate to city areas, very often ending up in poverty, stoking sectarian and economic tensions with the fallout that the world has both witnessed and felt. It's certainly not the only reason, but the dots can perhaps legitimately be found. 
And if you read commentary about the World Economic Forum in Davos, you will find plenty of material linking increasing global inequality, fueled by tax avoidance and other government-sanctioned financial schemes, to global poverty, inequality, which in turn can fuel popular uprisings, terrorism, migration, and internal displacement. No doubt, for every argument put thus, there is a counter-argument. But the figures in relation to increasing wealth disparity are undeniable, as is the fact that the much-discussed fourth industrial revolution is essentially replacing even more manufacturing jobs currently undertaken by humans with robots and 3D printers. The future may not be as futuristic as some of the more excitable ones at Davos would have us think, but the management of what comes next will be down to political choices and the issue when it comes to a human rights agenda is not just what those choices are, but who is influencing the making of those choices. The heads of single tech companies or other multinationals, for example, in many instances, have greater access to decision makers than the prime ministers of several small countries put together. And they certainly, as shown by Oxfam last week, again in Dallas, have more wealth. Just 62 people, 53 of them men, now own as much wealth as the entire bottom half of the world's population of 3.6 billion people. Last year, it was 85 people. And in the last number of years, what the EU does matters more and more to global multinationals. Simply by regulating its own huge market, it effectively regulates that of much of the globe. Its, regula its regulatory reach was witnessed last week as Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, met with EU Competition Commissioner Vestager in Brussels to discuss an ongoing investigation into Apple's tax affairs. And the recent EU court rulings on data protection have also caused major headaches for companies who want to mine or use EU citizens' data in the US in order to attract advertising and income streams. As a result, this city, Brussels, as you all know, is now populated by hundreds of global lobbyists, many of them running well-funded and highly sophisticated operations to make sure that the regulatory regime initially proposed by the Commission and then voted into place by the co-legislators of Council and Parliament is as favourable to their company's bottom line as possible, which is entirely their right. Some also play the long game, seeking not a new or amended regulation, but hoping instead to influence the manner in which regulations are drafted in the first place. For example, the extent to which impact assessments are skewed to favour business as opposed to, for example, environmental issues. And that's what's called business as usual, and is the way much of the world works. But in the EU, because of its nature, that business is not as visible to the so-called ordinary citizen as their own government or parliament's actions would be in their member states. Brussels is over there. It's obscure, it's difficult, it's bureaucratic, it's boring. All of the things that allow much of what goes on here, the good as well as the bad, to happen largely unnoticed by huge swathes of citizens, yet whose lives would be affected, nonetheless, <coughs> by the boring, bureaucratic, <coughs> difficult and obscure actions of the EU institutions and those who control them, both inside and out. And this is where the Office of the European Ombudsman can play a role. By trying to help to bridge the gap between citizen and institution, by making the obscure and the difficult more transparent, accessible and visible, it can at the very least allow the people to see how the laws that increasingly impact on their everyday lives are being made and who is influencing the play. When I took up office in late 2013, I was already quite familiar with the office as the European Ombudsman chairs the network of European Ombudsmen and I've been an Irish Ombudsman for 10 years. The European Ombudsman was introduced by the Maastricht Treaty as a way of bringing greater democracy to the EU and as a direct means for citizens to seek accountability from the EU institutions. Of course, the major difference between this office and that of Member State Ombudsman is that most citizens' complaints against the public administration have to do with areas in which the EU institutions do not have a direct involvement, such as social protection, health and education, so the number of citizens who would ever need the services of the European Ombudsman is necessarily limited. While we are contacted by more than 20,000 citizens annually, 
The majority of those queries or complaints are redirected to the national authorities or to another EU citizen support agency. We therefore open approximately 300 investigations per annum. So my challenge was how to make the office more relevant for the citizens and the institutions, how to insert myself into the areas of EU activity that are most relevant, most of public interest. I also realised that even though most of the issues I deal with initially have little obvious connection with the big human rights issues, migration, oppression, resource poverty, and the other big ticket items most easily identifiable as such, that the line between the complaints I receive and the big ticket human rights issues is a lot more direct than one would initially imagine. So let me give you some examples. Two of the first investigations I started concern matters of critical public interest. The safety of medicines authorised by the European Union and the negotiations between the EU and the US on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership deal. The first investigation was ongoing when I took up office, prompted by a number of transparency requests, one from an Irish man whose young adult son had taken his own life while taking the drug Roaccutane for a skin problem. The father had been denied access to clinical trial test results of the drug by the European Medicines Agency. As a result of the work of my predecessor and the work continued by me with the support of the Parliament, the agency eventually transformed its entire transparency policy, leading now to significantly greater proactivity and an outcome which helps to reinforce the safety standards of the drugs that we and our families take. The strategic investigation into TTIP was prompted not just by a series of individual access to documents requests, but by widespread concern that civil society in particular was not enabled fully to contribute to the dialogue around this critical trade agreement because it lacked the necessary access to the documents being created. The Commission has since adopted a much more proactive policy, the documents now released, so that a more informed debate on the potential economic, financial, environmental and other critical outcomes of the proposed agreement can be had. In that same vein, I'm currently inquiring into the transparency of the so-called trilogues process. These are the informal negotiations between the European Parliament, the Council and the Commission aimed to reach early agreement on new EU legislation and the investigation once again was prompted by concerns from parliamentarians and NGOs and business groups that this critical piece of lawmaking was not sufficiently transparent. In addition to getting opinions from the three institutions and inspecting documents, I have also begun a public consultation on this matter. Recent work with the European Central Bank has also yielded very positive results, with the bank agreeing to a more transparent meetings policy and agreeing to adopt a policy of silence in the seven days leading up to major announcements. The issue of lobbying also looms large in my casework, and rightly so, as it goes to the heart of the process of decision-making in the EU and the extent to which private interests are allowed, outside of public gaze, to influence lawmaking. A case which will shortly reach its conclusion when I get a response from the Commission involves the very fundamental right to health and the manner in which the Commission deals with the tobacco industry as it attempts to fight off industry-damaging regulation. Following a complaint from an NGO, I inquired into the practices of the European Commission in proactively publishing details of its meetings with the tobacco industry. Last October, I concluded that the Commission's approach to publicising such meetings is, with the exception of DG Health, inadequate, unreliable and unsatisfactory. In most of the cases, the Commission publishes information about such meetings, but only in response to access to documents requests or questions from MEPs. I found that certain meetings with lawyers representing the tobacco industry were not even considered as potentially meetings for the purpose of lobbying, something which I cannot accept. Overall, I found that the Commission is not fully implementing UN World Health Organization rules and guidelines governing transparency and tobacco lobbying to which the EU is a party under the WHO's Tobacco Control Convention. I recommended to the Commission that it should proactively publish online all meetings with tobacco lobbyists or their legal representatives, as well as the minutes of those meetings. I expect the Commission's response to this recommendation very shortly. There is a fundamental human rights uh, issue here. The right to be protected from a product which, in the words of the WHO Convention, has been proven scientifically to be addictive, to cause disease and death, 
and to give rise to a variety of social ills, including increased poverty. Another transparency-related area in which I've been active is that of the so-called revolving doors phenomenon. This is a reference to situations in which senior EU officials leave their employment and move to work in the private sector in areas sometimes relating directly to their former responsibilities while working within the EU. In such cases, it is possible that a former official can bring with him or her knowledge acquired while in EU employment, which is directly helpful to his or her new employer. In addition, such a former official is likely to have personal contacts within the EU institutions, which might be exploited for lobbying purposes or for privileged access to information. So because of these possibilities, and because of the possibility of unfair advantage being gained by a former official and his or her new employer, this is an area which requires regulation. And in 2014, I found that the then existing practices within the European Commission were inadequate. I recommended a number of specific measures to strengthen the review process in these cases. The Commission has, in broad terms, responded favourably to these recommendations. It has adopted the practice of publishing online the details of previous duties of the senior officials concerned, their new role outside the Commission, and its own assessment of possible conflicts of interest. The human rights aspect of that case relates again to transparency, to making sure that those with privileged access, which can be used to promote private interests with a possible risk to the public interest, are adequately supervised and that the public is aware of who is going where and who is potentially influencing a key interest of the EU citizen. Some of my investigations do, however, concern more familiar human rights territory. In May 2015, I made recommendations to Frontex, the EU border agency, on how to ensure respect for the fundamental right of migrants found not to be eligible for refugee status who are subject to forced returns from the EU to their countries at origin. Frontex coordinates and finances joint return operations by air in cooperation with member states. Between 2006 and 2015, it coordinated 267 joint return flights, returning more than 13,000 people. I asked Frontex to improve the travel arrangements for pregnant women and families with children. I also dealt with the need for common rules on the use of restraint, the need for Frontex to assist member states in improving complaints procedures and other measures. Following an earlier inquiry, Frontex declined to act on my recommendation that it set up its own mechanism to deal with complaints from individuals subject to forced return. I reported this to the European Parliament and I was happy that Parliament adopted a resolution that Frontex should set up a complaints mechanism. One of my strategic priorities is to increase cooperation with the members of the European Network of Ombudsmen. And in this Frontex case, I received valuable contributions from some Ombudsman colleagues at member state level. At present, I'm involved in another initiative with Ombudsman colleagues at national level, which also relates to the human rights of migrants. This initiative relates to the spending at member state level of EU funds in the area of migration. Specifically, it concerns the use of the EU's Asylum, Migration and Integration Fund. At present, a number of national Ombudsmen are planning inquiries in their own countries on the extent to which human rights obligations are being met in the manner in which this fund is being used. I'm also taking soundings from my colleagues on a potential parallel investigation into lobbying transparency in the member states. This idea was partly prompted by the recent Volkswagen emissions affair and the questions that arose as to how a regime that allowed emission rates to be obscured could have been put into place. Some ombudsmen do have a role in this area of administrative uh, accountability, but by no means all. I accept that the human rights link isn't always immediately obvious, but when one, one speaks about lobbying transparency, when one speaks about lobbying transparency, but when one considers the health effects of diesel emissions, it becomes a lot clearer. One reported estimate was of one million tonnes of additional air pollution per annum worldwide caused by the undetected emissions, a sum equivalent to roughly that of the UK's combined emissions for all power stations, vehicles, industry and agriculture. And when one considers the power of the lobbies in other health sensitive areas, from chemical to pharmaceuticals to pesticides and so on, one can really begin to see how important this piece of work may be. So to conclude, while we are necessarily mainly preoccupied at the moment with the migration issue, we cannot ignore the less obvious areas of potential human rights abuse. 
as the EU Special Envoy said here, most conflicts have a human rights dimension, and so does their resolution. Last Sunday, as I was preparing this talk, I took some time out to see the new movie, The Big Short, which tells the story of the US banking collapse and the subsequent global fallout. At the end of the movie, we see on screen a damning list of the human fallout of political, personal, and regulatory failure in terms of homes, jobs, savings, and pensions lost. But what is not on screen, because it is not amenable to easy calculations, are the lives and families destroyed and the number of suicides prompted by financial despair. Regulatory failure may not be a crime, but it is certainly not victimless either. And as European Ombudsman, as I deal with issues outside the traditional human rights mainstream, my job is to join those dots between administrative failure, lack of transparency, conflicts of interest, ethical failure, and the actual human fallout. In one scene in the movie, an employee of the US regulator, the Securities Exchange Commission, flirts with a banker in an attempt to secure more lucrative employment in the private banking sector. When she's asked if it's not illegal to move from a regulator straight into an industry that it's supposed to be regulating, she laughs and answers, of course not. I was, of course, reminded of the revolving doors investigation, the scene reinforcing my belief that dry administrative matters, such as rules concerning post-public service appointment, are not dry at all, but can have unforeseen, real-time and very negative outcomes. The Turkish writer Alif Shafak, whom I mentioned earlier, was asked about the prospects for political and human rights reform in Turkey, and I think her answer was intended to deal with the wider issue of human rights globally. She replied that she was half pessimistic and half optimistic, a case of, as she said, optimism of the will, pessimism of the intellect. Speaking last month at the European Parliament at the presentation of the Sakharov Prize to the Saudi freedom of speech advocate Raif Badawi, in fact, the prize was presented to his wife as Mr. Badawi is serving a 10 year sentence in the Saudi prison. Parliament's President Martin Schulz said, No terror, no inhumane penal system will prevent us from fighting for human rights. No security argument, no weapons deal, or oil money may deter us. We have to hope that President Schulz is right in what he says. Without having unrealistic expectations of what human rights can deliver, human rights advocates must continue always to press the need for politicians to act in line with the legal commitments they have entered into under the various human rights conventions. As European Ombudsman, I see it as part of my job to continue to insist that the EU, through its institutions, must act in a way which respects the human rights commitments which the EU and its individual member states have freely agreed to be bound by. Thank you for your attention.